Hi everyone, my name is Mohit Kumar Jolly and I'm a graduate student at Rice University. Today, I'm going to take you on a journey of how mathematics or theoretical physics and experimental biology can come together and produce novel insights into biological systems that none of those disciplines would otherwise have done alone. And today, I'm going to talk about how math and biology together can give a better understanding of how cancer cells communicate and cooperate and drive tumor progression. Math and biology sounds two different extremes. How did I get interested in coupling them? Well, I was always interested, but the point of no return came during my master's at IIT Kanpur when I was working on a mathematical model of cell polarity. I showed this model to a group of experimental biologists and they shot at me. Well, this is just a model. What does it have to do with reality? And I shot back at them. Well, what do you study? Drosophila. That's also a model. What does that have to do with reality? So both of them are models. One is a mathematical model, one is a biological model. Both of them have their own assumptions, strengths and limitations. Can we not actually couple their strengths together so that we can produce some new insights into the system? Because eventually, isn't that the goal? All right, coming back to cancer. Cancer. This word sends a shiver down our spine. Each of us directly or indirectly have been affected by it. Well, what is cancer? So let's take an example. Here is a normal liver where all cells are functioning properly. But when due to some aberrations, genetic, environmental or some other reason, some cells start dividing uncontrollably in a manner that disrupts the normal physiological functioning of the organ, that is when is cancer. As you can see in the image, some white speckles which is cancerous tissue which is taking over the normal tissue function. But this is not the most destructive part about cancer. This is not why most people die of cancer. More than 90% of cancer related deaths happen because cancer spreads to different parts of the body. How does it spread? It spreads through the freeway in our body, which is the blood vessels and lymph vessels. So imagine a tumor in a lung, it will get on the freeway and then travel all through the body and take an exit at multiple distant organs to form metastasis, to form secondary tumor. Metastasis is the entire process of forming tumors from one organ to another. And this is what claims more than 90% of all deaths. The war on cancer was declared in 1971. What have we done since? We have made huge progress in diagnosing cancer earlier, such as with these mammograms. We have made huge progress in identifying what risk factors contribute to cancer, such as smoking causes lung cancer. And we have made some huge progress in identifying what genes and what mutations can drive cancer. For instance, mutation in a gene called BRCA1 is the reason for many women getting ovarian and breast cancer. And that was the reason why Angelina Jolly had to undergo a double mastectomy in order to reduce her risk of getting breast cancer. But despite this progress, metastasis, the spread of cancer cells from one organ to another, remains clinically insurmountable. We are still trying to scratch the surface of how exactly this process happens. This diagram here just shows where to which different organs though the breast cancer metastasize. And the most intriguing thing about metastasis is that more than 80% of cancers begin in organs where cells do not have the innate property to move or migrate. Let's talk about breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer. Those cells do not have the property to migrate on their own. So cancer switches on a distinct program which enables them to get on the freeway and survive through the harsh conditions in the bloodstream and then get off the freeway and again adapt to a whole new foreign environment of a distant organ and colonize it eventually there for disrupting its physiological function. So when cancer colonizes multiple different organs of the body, the probability of the survival of the patient goes down further and that is why metastasis is most dangerous. Well, if we have the list of genes or proteins that control metastasis, why don't we completely understand the process? Let me give you an analogy. 
if you have all the different car parts, do you understand how a car moves? Not necessarily. You actually have to put those parts together in an integrated, coherent manner, then only you understand how a car moves. Similarly, you have to put together all different genes in the way that they are actually connected within a cell to understand how exactly a cell moves, a cancer cell moves, a cancer cell metastasizes. So in other words, car as a system, as a whole, is much greater than sum of its parts. And that is what we call as an emergent system. And that is what cancer and cancer metastasis is, an emergent system. And this approach of putting things together is one which is very natural to physicists and engineers, because engineers are the one who put together this car. So can we put together different genes or proteins in the way that they interact in a cell in order to get a better understanding of metastasis as a system, as an emergent complex system? Let me give you an example. Weather forecast. Today, we can predict weather very accurately. Well, what is going to happen in the next seven days or even further? When are we going to get thunderstorm? When are we going to get good sunlight? And based on that, we actually make our travel plans, which means we trust it so much. Well, it took at least a century to get here. Climate scientists, physicists, and engineers, they collected all different factors that contribute to weather of a particular place, climate of a particular place, and then put them together in the way that they actually interact, including how strongly they interact with one another. And this is just a primitive set of equations that actually controls this. There's a lot of math that went behind it, and that is where we are today after having undergone this uh, validation and calculation of the model. So can we today begin this journey of putting together various genes and proteins that interact with each other to control metastasis. And not necessarily today, but some, some years down the line, can we build a model which can actually predict metastasis? Can we have that amount of trust in it just as we have in the weather forecast today? So today, I'm going to take you on the first few steps of that journey that I have latched on to. All right, so metastasis. So when cancer cells leave the primary tumor, they can do it in two different ways. They can either leave as single cells or they can form a cluster before they enter the freeway and then leave together. It is like whether is there a set of cars leaving at the different times or is there a set of cars that are together on a ramp just waiting to get on the freeway. Experiments have shown that there are 30 times more single cells that are shed off the tumor as compared to only clusters. But the clusters form 50 times more secondary tumors or metastasis than single cells. And these clusters are not too large. They are two to seven cells large. So you can do the math and realize that there is indeed something to cancer cells staying together and that is what leads to much more metastasis. There is a value in staying together. United they stand, divided they fall. So what exactly is this value and how do cancer cells utilize it? Let's go through that. So if these are the real villains of metastasis, these clusters, then let's try to understand how do cancer cells form these clusters? How can we break these clusters? What targets can we use? And eventually, why do these clusters form much more metastasis? Let's go to the first part, how do cancer cells form these clusters? Before we go into the details, let me give you a relatively detailed understanding of how metastasis actually happens. So let's consider that these primary lung cancer cells, now they do not have the innate property to move as we discussed earlier. So in order to move, in order to get on the freeway, they need to do two things. They need to break their bonds with the neighbors, the tight cell cell adhesion that they have, and at the same time, they need to gain the property to migrate and invade. Now, this property of staying together and not moving is the property of epithelial cells in our body, such as the skin and the cells that line multiple organs, such as breast, prostate, and lung. On the other hand, the property of not adhering and migrating is the property of mesenchymal cells in our body, such as red blood cells. So when cancer cells have to get on the freeway, they need to take on these properties of mesenchymal cells. 
I'm not saying that they have to convert to mesenchymal cells. They don't have to become red blood cells, but they have to take on these properties. And this transition is what is called as epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is usually the first step in the metastatic cascade. Now, once they're in the freeway, once they're in the blood circulation, and they survive, and they get out at a different organ, take an exit, now what they need to do is that grow an entire new tumor for which they need to shed their migration and invasion properties and regain their property of adhering to their neighbors. And this is the exact opposite transition that we just talked about, mesenchymal to epithelial transition, which is usually the last step in this metastatic cycle. And the cycle can continue, go on and on, forming multiple uh, secondary or tertiary tumors at multiple different organs in the body. Now, EMT or MET, as I will refer to them uh, throughout the talk, are not some new processes invented by cancer. These are normal physiological processes that happen during embryonic development and even wound healing. And these processes are co-opted by cancer to metastasize. Let's talk about wound healing for a bit. So when you get a wound on your skin, you see the cells move together and actually close that wound. And once the wound is filled, they stop moving and settle down. So this is exactly what EMT and MET is going on. But those cells typically move collectively. So which is not really epithelial and not really mesenchymal. So is there a state somewhere in between where cells can both adhere and migrate, which can close the wound? And in the case of cancer, it can form much more clusters. Is there a stable state, a hybrid state in between? So recent studies have observed that in circulating tumor cells in patients, those cells can co-express epithelial and mesenchymal proteins, suggesting that they are somewhere hybrid in nature. More importantly, what they observed based on the biopsies of primary tumor is that the more aggressive the cancer is, the more the number of such cells. Of course, this is just a correlation, not a cause and effect, but it definitely points to some uh, correlation, uh, it definitely points to some connection between how hybrid cells, how many hybrid cells are and how aggressive the tumor is. But despite this, the feeling in the field has been that, well, this is just a transient nature. It's, it, the cells cannot actually maintain this state for a very long time. And this is just a snapshot that got captured when cells were en route EMT. So that is the question that got me most excited. Is this a stable state or is it just a transient, intermediate, unstable state? So here are the three states we have been talking about. Epithelial to the very left, where cells adhere at very strongly and do not move. Mesenchymal to the extreme right, where cells migrate, but they do not adhere. And in between is this hybrid state where cells both adhere and migrate, therefore leading to this collective cell migration or clustered cell migration. Now, how do we understand how cells can attain this state, whether hybrid is a stable state at all or not? Again, going back to the approach of putting together the car parts together. So what I did was scan through literature of multiple different cell lines belonging to multiple different cancers and try to identify, well, is there some core unit? Is there some core set of proteins, genes, microRNAs that interact with each other and control EMT in multiple different contexts? And this is the network I came up with where there are four different players which are connected to each other in a relatively complicated manner, the details of which I'm not going into. And there are two of which are transcription factors and two of which are microRNAs. The numbers you see here represent some kind of a quantitative relationship between them. But again, I'll not bog you with the details. The only thing I want you to remember is that what we know experimentally is that the amount, if the amount of snail and zeb is high, then cells are mesenchymal. And if the amount of snail and zeb is low, then cells are epithelial. All right, so then after finding these interactions, I wrote down mathematical equations which actually represent these interactions. And after doing calculation over these equations, let's see what exactly the model predicts. So here is a uh, prediction of the model where there are three solid lines, each of which represents a stable state, which is a phenotype that cells can attain. The dotted red lines represent unstable states. So going back to standard uh, high school physics, 
we know that if unstable state is perturbed, it exits that state. So cells cannot actually stay in that state. So therefore, we are going to focus only on the stable states in this context. Now let me break down this graph for you. So out of the four players that we discussed, I have here taken only two players just for the purpose of representation to see what exactly the model says. So at very low levels of Zeb, which is the y-axis, you see there is only one state, which is epithelial. And that is what we know from experiments. At very high levels of Zeb, again, there is only one state, which is mesenchymal. And in between, you see this another solid blue line, which corresponds to intermediate Zeb levels, Zeb levels which are higher than those seen in epithelial and lower than those seen in mesenchymal. And these intermediate state corresponds to a stable hybrid state. So the prediction of the model is that, yes, there is a stable hybrid state that cells can achieve. All right, let me walk you through another facet of this graph. So if you see the very left part of the graph, now let's look, we have already looked horizontally, now let's look vertically. So here, what you see is that if the amount of snail protein is less than 180,000 molecules, and if you walk vertically upwards, there is only one blue solid line that you cross, which means that there is only one state that cells in this region of parameters or in this region of conditions can attain. And that state, as you can see from Zeb levels, is epithelial state. Going to the very right, there is another region in which, again, there is only one state. But that particular state is not epithelial, but the state with highest Zeb levels, which is mesenchymal, actually. And in between, we see these interesting regions. For example, let's uh, draw a vertical line from 200,000 molecules of snail, and you see it will cross three distinct blue curves. And each of those blue curves corresponds to a stable state, as I've already mentioned. And these three stable states are epithelial, mesenchymal, and hybrid. So again, what the model predicts is that there can be some conditions under which these three states can coexist with each other. So if there might be, uh, in experimental cases, some cell lines in which you can see that all these different three kinds of cells or phenotypes are present in the cells with the same genetic background, which is what a cell line is. So once we made this model, we wrote to a couple of experimental biologists working on EMT trying to see, well, how do they react to this? Do they react in a very similar way that my master's experimental biologists do? Or they are actually supportive of this? So one group in Seattle actually wrote back, among other groups as well, and said, well, we have two good news for you. One is that we have been looking at a cohort of 40 different uh, lung cancer cell lines. And we actually see that many of them lie somewhere in between epithelial and mesenchymal. And the other good news is that we are moving to Houston right across the street from Rice University at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So why don't you come over and we can discuss. And this was indeed the turning point. So once we discussed with them, they had these intermediate cell lines which were lying somewhere in between epithelial and mesenchymal. And how did they identify that these were intermediate? Because they took measurements of uh, several epithelial and mesenchymal proteins and their mRNA levels. But beware. All these measurements were taken on a population level. They took 1,000 or more cells of this and then crushed them and see what was the amount of mRNA present in them. And this is the problem with taking population level measurements that you actually do not see what is going on at a single cell level. So when we looked at those cell lines, what we observed was that there was some cell lines in which there were some epithelial cells and some mesenchymal cells but not hybrid cells. So here is the cell line as shown here, where red is marking an epithelial protein and green is marking a mesenchymal protein in this immunofluorescence images. So you see cells are either only red or only green, which means they're only epithelial or only mesenchymal. Another cell line where you see that cells actually co-express red and green at a single cell level. So these are indeed hybrid cells, which is different from a mixture. So a mixture is different than a hybrid cell. Its characterization is different. Its migration traits are expected to be different, and so on and so forth. Again, this is a snapshot. What is a stable state? If it is perturbed, it comes back. Or in other words, it retains itself, if not perturbed. So in order to see whether this hybrid cell line, which, we, which got us so excited, was indeed a stable state, we our experimental collaborators, they actually cultured this cell line for multiple passages and saw that even after two months, they were actually co-expressing red and green, 
which is what is suggesting that yes, they can be indeed stably present in that hybrid state. Now, another thing that I've been talking about is that these hybrid cells are likely to move collectively. Now, let's see if that is shown in the experiments also, because eventually the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? So, here we take a mesenchymal cell line and a hybrid cell line, and what we do, our experimental collaborators did, is a scratch assay where you actually grow cells until they are confluent on a plate, and then you just mark a scratch using a needle. And the way cells move to fill in that gap is what is used to characterize their migration properties. Now, let's see how mesenchymal cells moved. So, the rightmost column is just showing a zoomed in image of the middle column. And as you can see, these cells are flying out as single cells. They just don't have any direct physical connection to each other. However, the hybrid cells are moving more collectively. They have not yet broken their bonds with their neighbors. They are actually moving collectively, therefore leading to these finger-like projections as pointed by these white arrows. So indeed, these cells are hybrid because it's, it's a stable state and of course they move collectively. Now we were very intrigued with this hybrid cell line because in our diagram, in our model, we did not have a parameter region or in which the only state was hybrid. So that's what got us thinking that, well, what, how can we tweak the model? How can we add or delete components from it so that we can get a region in which the only state is hybrid? And also, at the same time, we wanted to identify, well, what targets can break these clusters? So if we can identify what can give us a hybrid, stable hybrid state, only stable hybrid state, deleting that can destabilize the hybrid state and potentially uh, lead to disrupted collective cell migration. All right, so let's go back to the math. So this is the diagram I showed you earlier, and I would again like to highlight here that there is no parameter region in which the only state is hybrid. There is a parameter region in which the only state is epithelial, there is a parameter region in which the only state is mesenchymal, but not a region in which the only state is hybrid. So then, I went back to wound healing and developmental EMT literature and see if they are talking about some players which can either disrupt or maintain collective cell migration. And once I had a list of players from that literature, I looked at, well, do we know how exactly they couple to the players that we have here? And once we had a list of players which were implicated in collective cell migration, as well as we had enough quantitative information about that to couple to this model, uh, I actually incorporated that into our model, and as you will see, the diagram changes. So this is just one example that I'm showing you here. This particular protein called GRHL2, which connects with ZEB, it inhibits ZEB and is inhibited by ZEB, and you see the diagram changes, and if you look at approximately 400,000 molecules of snail and go vertically upwards, as shown in this region highlighted by this dotted rectangle, you see the only state is hybrid. So adding this single factor stabilized the hybrid state. Again, let's go to the inverse. Deleting this should destabilize the hybrid state. Again, let's back, go back to the experiments and see if it actually holds true. So we went back to the same cell line, which was stably hybrid. And as you can see, again, they are moving collectively, as you can see in the left column. On the right column, what we did was we deleted that particular protein from the cell line, and you see that there migration is not completely collective now, it has been disrupted and they start to begin more as single cells. Also, when we looked for the presence of red and green or epithelial and mesenchymal proteins that we have been talking about, this intermediate cell line, as I showed you earlier, this hybrid cell line co-expresses red and green in the same cell, but with the knockdown of this single protein as predicted by the mathematical model, you see that the red just goes away and the cells are only mesenchymal. And that is consistent with the idea that they are moving more as single cells rather than as collective cells. So we predicted this from the model and then we got uh, eventually validated. I, I should remind you that the whole idea about this project came from that there is a stable hybrid cell line. So this is a wonderful example of how biology can inform math and math can inform biology and we can uh, iteratively go forward to have a better understanding of the system. Now, once we had done this in vitro um, validation, we wanted to go to some clinical data and see if it supports our hypothesis. So, high amount of this protein, GRHL2, 
will potentially lead to more collective migration, more clusters, and more clusters will decrease the survival period. So what I did was look at a cohort of approximately 1000 lung cancer patients, which were divided into high and low amount of this protein. And then we looked at their 5 year and 10 year survival probabilities. So as you can see that patients that have high amount of this protein have a lower probability of progression free survival, which means that the disease has actually progressed in more cases as compared to the percentage of cases in which there are less uh, amount of this particular protein. And that is what is shown in the graph here. The red line shows the cases where the protein have, where the patients have high amount of this protein and the black graph shows that the black curve shows the cases when patients have low amount of this protein and there is a difference, a stark difference in both in a 5 year and 10 year survival probabilities which is consistent with other hypothesis. Alright, so we have talked about these two aspects which both of which are connected to how cancer cells get on the freeway. Now let's talk about the last aspect that is once they have survived the circulation and got off the freeway to a secondary organ, to a distant organ how exactly they form secondary tumors. So why do clusters form or metastasis? Again, a very similar approach that what we have been talking about, putting together parts of a car. Take the EMT network that we have been studying and take the tumor initiation network as reported in published experimental data and see how they are connected to each other again as published in the data. And then simulate this and see what the model predicts. Now why this project was most exciting to me was because there were three different papers comparing the tumor initiation ability of epithelial and mesenchymal cells, the cells that do not move and the cells that move as single cells individually. And they said three completely different things. One, the first paper said that when cells undergo EMT to become mesenchymal, they form much more tumors. A couple of years later, another paper saying that, well, when cells become mesenchymal, their tumor initiation ability goes down and the cells that are epithelial are the ones that form more tumors. And the last one saying, well, they are almost comparable. Epithelial and mesenchymal can initiate almost equal number of tumors. There is not a stark difference in their ability. Now, this is conflicting, hugely confounding. And one of the reasons why I thought uh, that this uh, paradox is being reported is that because all these studies actually categorized cells into two categories, either epithelial or mesenchymal. So they completely missed on to this hybrid stable cells which were miscategorized as either epithelial or mesenchymal. And it can be different in different studies therefore leading to these potentially different results. So then when I simulated this model of uh, EMT and tumor initiation network put together, the model predicted that the cells in the hybrid, cells that are hybrid actually form much more tumors than cells that are only epithelial or only mesenchymal. Now, one year later after we published this, there was an experimental study which to the best of my knowledge is the first study that categorizes cells into three different categories. These are also breast cancer cells. Uh, epithelial, hybrid and mesenchymal segregates them and then looks at their tumor initiation ability and as you can see, tumor initiation ability of the hybrid cells is 10 times more than tumor initiation ability of only epithelial or only mesenchymal which is again very consistent with what the model predicted. Of course, we didn't have this 10 times number but it's qualitatively the same uh, result. So just summarizing, so I've taken you through a journey of how theoretical physics or mathematics can be coupled with experimental biology to get insights into this entire process of tumor progression and metastasis. So the first part was, well, how do cancer cells form these clusters where we made a network of EMT and MET and predicted that indeed hybrid state is a stable state which is what is in contradiction to the uh, current existing framework with, where people believe it's just a transient state. Then the next part was how can we break these clusters where again based on mathematical modeling then in vitro experimental validation and then based on some clinical data we uh, concluded that GRHL2 might be an important player to break those uh, cluster migration. And then in the last part we tried to offer an explanation of why clusters might be forming more metastasis because clusters is the one that is uh, that are usually corresponding to a hybrid state and hybrid state is the one that has much more tumor initiation ability than either mesenchymal or uh, epithelial 
So just concluding, as I already uh, indicated, the existing framework has been that this hybrid state is just transient. Cells cannot maintain it for a very long time. But what we showed first based on mathematical modeling and then based on experimental validation that indeed it can be a stable state in some scenarios and it can move collectively. Therefore, this state might be the reason behind why clusters form much more metastasis because it enables the formation of uh, clusters of circulating tumor cells or CTCs. Now, what are the clinical implications of this work? So these days, there's a lot of talk about liquid biopsy. Now, what is liquid biopsy? How is it different from solid biopsy? So solid biopsy is when you take a, a chunk of mass from a tumor from a patient and then try to characterize it. Liquid biopsy is that instead of taking that chunk of solid tumor mass, you take the blood of a patient, which, and this process is much quicker than taking an entire solid mass. It is uh, much less invasive. It is much less painful. So there are, there are multiple advantages to this. That's why people are uh, very uh, excited about this, its use in the clinic. So once we have access to blood, we can actually focus on circulating tumor cells. And once we have circulating tumor cells, currently what people are doing are they are not necessarily distinguishing between single circulating tumor cells versus clustered circulating tumor cells. All of them are being counted just as total number of CTCs in the blood, which uh, we suggest is not necessarily the entire picture. You need to look at whether they are single or they are clustered. And if there are more clustered, if there are, if a patient has more clustered cell, potentially that patient is going to have a much worse outcome. So therefore, you need to have a much uh, aggressive therapy going on to attack that aggressive tumor. And also, if we can take these measurements at multiple time points from the same patient, it can also be used to monitor the disease progression and see how well the patient is doing. If there are more clusters or the therapies are not having that good an effect, but if there are less clusters, then potentially they're having a relatively stronger effect in this particular case. All right. And I will just uh, like to end with the last message from the documentary that was made based on cancer, the emperor of all maladies, which is that if the cancer cell is evolving, so are we. And I strongly believe that a part of this evolution is bringing together math and biology and therefore understanding what design principles does cancer operate on and can we actually be smarter than that. And with that, I would like to acknowledge all the different mentors and colleagues I've had on this journey of integrating math and biology together. My advisors, uh, Herbert Levine, Eshel Ben-Jacob. Eshel unfortunately passed away an year ago. And my other mentors at Center for Theoretical Biological Physics, Jose Onuchik and Cindy Faraj Carson. Cindy is an experimental biologist who has been extremely, extremely supportive of using theory to understand uh, more cancer. And my experimental collaborators from MD Anderson, Duke, MIT, Johns Hopkins and my theoretical gang at Center for Theoretical Biological Physics at Rice University. Thank you so much for listening.